Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. I want to welcome you to our um, Wednesday night Bible study here at Sir North Calvary Baptist Church. We're going to go ahead and jump right in. I know it's uh, probably raining in most places, especially if you're here in uh, Central or uh, South Florida. And I hope you stay safe out there. Um, tonight, we're going to go ahead and uh, continue with uh, the Galatians, Galatians, the Christians, and the Mosaic Law. We're going to do a part two. Uh, Reverend Chisholm is here by phone, and um, if any questions are, are had or explanations needed, uh, he'll be here to answer those uh, as we go along. Uh, so with that, uh, Reverend Chisholm, you mind open us a word of prayer, please, sir? Sure, let's pray. Sovereign God, we come to you once again in the name of Jesus, thanking you for the loan of life for today. Thank you for the blessings you sent our way, undeserving of them though we were and are. Uh, we ask for your blessings, that your word might speak to our spirits, our souls, our minds. May we hear you, understand you, and seek to rise up in obedience to your word. So bless our time together, here live and later on the YouTube channel. We pray these things for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, as I said, we we're, this will be recorded and put uh, uploaded later to the YouTube. So um, if something here touches you and you believe it will touch somebody else, you can just click the share button and be able to send it uh, via text, via email, or even via, I think, YouTube um, link as well. Uh, like I said, we're going to go ahead and continue with Galatians, the Christians, and the Mosaic Law. And uh, we'll just go ahead and uh, jump right into that. And for those who were here last week or watching last week, yes, we had some uh, technical issues here. Uh, the internet had gone down. So um, last week's um, session was in two sessions. All right. So hope everybody was able to uh, navigate through that. All right, here we go. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature, and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. We are this week looking at the epistle to the Galatians and we have been saying that we want to understand how an individual attains and maintains that special and sufficient spiritual status before God that we call salvation. And Paul under attack from certain preachers in the Galatian region in chapter 1 defends his apostolic call 
He says, brethren, regardless of what you maintain, I did not get it from man. My apostleship did not originate with any man, neither was it mediated to me by any man. It came to me from God, through Jesus Christ. And as he moves on, we saw him in verse 6 displaying concern for the people of God. I marvel, I am amazed, I am stunned, I am bewildered that you are so soon turned from the grace of God unto a suspect gospel, indeed unto a false gospel, which is another of a different kind and not another of the same kind that I gave to you. And the people who are preaching this kind of gospel to you, that you need circumcision and you need to keep the Mosaic law to be right before God, their only intention, he says, is to pervert the gospel of God and to perplex your minds and your hearts, trying to challenge your status in Christ and trying to destabilize you from your sense of oneness in Jesus Christ. Even though improbable as it might be, we or an angel from heaven were to preach to you any other gospel than that which we proclaim to you, run him. Do not give that individual a hearing. Do not give that individual any heed. For the standard has already been given. The yardstick has already been laid out. The gauge has already been passed on to you. And every competing gospel must be checked by the yardstick of what I proclaimed to you when I shared the truth of the gospel with you. As we move on today to chapter 2, there are a few preliminary remarks I'd like to make. It is very easy for us listening to the discourse this week to forget who is the person who has written this epistle. It is not Clinton Chisholm, a Gentile, who is upset at discovering that the law is necessary for right standing before God. The writer is a Jew. It is Paul, a strict Pharisee, not somebody who is upset because he has just learned that he must keep the law to be right with God. And this is no ordinary Jew either. The man says in chapter 1, by his training, by his upbringing, he had outstripped his contemporaries. You could not find anybody who was more concerned about the Jewish traditions than Paul. Concerned as a strict Pharisee, not only for the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, but also for the Halakha, the rabbinical interpretations and additions to the Torah. He was a religious and strict Pharisee. Very concerned then, about the traditions of his fathers. That's his own testimony in chapter 1 and verse 13. But understand this. It was Paul's devotion to the Jewish law that made him cut against the church. He was so concerned that the traditions of the fathers must be upheld that anybody who stood against those traditions must be not only argued against, but must be killed. You wouldn't go to that extent, I'm sure, in trying to persuade anybody to be a Christian. But Paul was very zealous for the law of God. And if you're not with the law, you're against the law, and you must be put away. So he killed many Christians. And if God had not stopped him by grace, in time, there would have been no church to talk about now. You see, brethren, what really irritated Paul 
was the fact that there were certain Christians who were preaching that a man gets right with God by simple, plain, ordinary, old faith in Jesus Christ. Paul said that's nonsense. You cannot get right with God by putting faith in this Jesus who died on a piece of wood. You get right with God by keeping the Mosaic law, by being circumcised. Key marks of the first people of God. It is important then that we keep, not at the back of our minds, but in the forefront of our minds, that before Paul got saved, he realized that law and gospel could not mix. This is why he was willing to kill gospel. They cannot mix. They cannot be married. If you try to marry them, they remain unequally yoked for life. Since that is so, get rid of gospel. Let law remain. And the church was going to be wiped out because of that agenda that he had in his heart. The truth remains. After he got saved, he realized as well law and gospel cannot mix. They cannot be married. You cannot even legitimately engage them. Something is going to go wrong somewhere. Therefore, if gospel stands, law must be put in its right perspective. And this is his burden in the epistle to the Galatians. It's like trying to mix the two covenants. The one had a legitimate place in the plan of God. But we must understand the place of the first covenant. And we must understand the role, the supreme role of the second covenant. So when Paul was converted on the road to Damascus, at that point and since then, he recognized in Jesus Christ the only principle of salvation, faith in Jesus to the absolute exclusion of the Mosaic law. Now then, chapter 2. Is this man, as some claimed then, and as some Judaizers claim now, a rebel, a renegade Jew, a backslidden Jew, a man who had nothing to do with the traditions of the early church? No. In chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul says, brethren, understand this. I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation. In other words, this is not a renegade, this is not a lone wolf, this is not a lone star. He says, even though I am persuaded that what I'm doing is absolutely correct, orthodox before God, yet I proclaimed it to them, the people of the early church community, and privately to the chief apostles. Why? Lest my labors in the past were in vain and lest I might be right now running in vain in other words realizing that he was right before God he held up his gospel for careful scrutiny of the brethren in general and of the leadership of the church in particular I want to push in a little thing here for I am becoming very concerned about many modern-day Christians who claim to be getting revelations from God. They're under nobody's authority. They are subject to no one. They simply go there as lone wolves and they preach, I got this revelation from God. If it is really of God, 
there is no problem in subjecting it to the scrutiny of the brethren in general and of the leadership of the church to which you belong in particular. I beg you learn a lesson from Paul. When he exposed the content of his gospel to these pillars of Christianity, Peter, James, and John, look what he says about that encounter. The content of his gospel was approved by these pillars of Christianity. From verse 7 through to verse 9, he explains this. He says, contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as and there is no the gospel again in the greek original you will notice in your bibles if they are written properly that that second the gospel is in italics meaning it is not in the original just one word because there's just one gospel when they saw that the gospel with reference to the gentiles was committed to me as the same gospel with reference to the Jews was committed unto Peter. And jump to verse 9. And when James, Cephas, or Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision the same gospel but two different sets of recipients keep in your minds then not a renegade not a lone wolf not a rebel not a backslidden jew but one who has seen greater light in jesus one who by the grace of God was led to realize that the Jewish traditions were shadow. But substance has now come. That the Jewish traditions was, were prophecy. But fulfillment has now come in Jesus Christ. And it is the same gospel that Peter was preaching to the Jews. That Paul was preaching to the Gentiles. The heart of the gospel then said, a man does not need to be circumcised, nor does a man need to keep the Mosaic law to attain and maintain special and sufficient spiritual status before God. And Paul had the agreement of Peter, James, and John on that score. Let me go on to highlight two things then, which will become very understandable with that background. Two things. One, Paul's denunciation of Peter. And two, Paul's defense of the gospel. But let's look at Paul's denunciation of Peter. Verse 11, after giving that lovely background, they heard my gospel. They approved my gospel. He says... But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. In other words, this was a public confrontation between Paul and Peter. Partly explained by Paul's temperament. He's not the calmest of persons that you will meet in the New Testament. Anybody can detect that easily fiery tempered person you remember that fight in acts of the apostles where paul didn't want to take john mark the greek says it was a literal quarrel and fight not just hard talking maybe only god blocked paul from giving some solid fists to his colleague serious thing the man is not worthy how can you take this man and the fiery tempered paul moves on but later thank god the man is now fit for missionary work and he takes him never writes off a man completely but never unafraid 
to confront you in the interest of the truth of the gospel. And twice he says that statement in this chapter. Quickly glance at verse 5. Why was Titus not circumcised? Because as a full-blooded Gentile, it was not necessary. And if I had had him circumcised, I would be compromising the truth of the gospel, showing that I feared these Jewish bigwigs who were pressing that he be circumcised. Then in verse 14, when he challenges Peter, he says the same thing. When I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. At stake then was the heart of the gospel. And Paul would not allow anybody, not even his closest colleague in ministry, to compromise, to cut against the truth of the gospel. So here then is this public confrontation between these two big wigs in Christendom. Why was it necessary? One. And why was it necessary in public? Why not take the man aside, Paul, and just talk with him as a brother and plead with him? Why in public? Why are you putting up Peter, who is a senior colleague in Christ? Why are you putting him up for public disgrace for good reasons i believe peter was being inconsistent and hypocritical with respect to jewish dietary laws practices which were all part of the mosaic law and don't let any modern judaizer tell you that the law is split up into three neat categories we have the moral law the ceremonial law and the societal law and only two parts have been abrogated at Calvary not so you won't find that neat distinction in the scriptures one law yes with sections and as we will see God willing later this week what God intended for that total law moral ceremonial and societal and what now operates with us as Christians but the man was inconsistent what was the situation? Peter, though being a Jew, normally and correctly sat down and had table fellowship with Gentiles. Now you would know that a Jew does not have table fellowship with a Gentile normally for two good reasons. One, the Gentile is an unclean dog. And two, the Gentile eats unclean food. So you dare not mix with the Gentile if you are an orthodox, upright, well-thinking Jew. But Peter, as an upright, orthodox, well-thinking Jew, mingled with the Gentiles. He not only mixed with them, and I hope the Caribbean distinction between mix and mingle is alive in your minds. When you mix, you associate. When you mingle, you go deeper than simple association. You're seeking intimacy. Peter mixed and mingled with the Gentiles as a Jew. That was his way of life normally. But now, some big weeks from Jerusalem have come down to Antioch. And what does Peter do? He backs off as if he doesn't know the Gentiles. Doesn't eat with them anymore. And Paul says, no. Something is wrong here, Peter. Normally and correctly, you eat with your brethren because you realize from the truth of the gospel that there's no distinction ethnically between us as Jews and them as Gentiles. Why then, because of your friends, have you stopped eating with your Gentile brothers and sisters? What is there in that to make a fuss about Paul? It's no big thing. The man just didn't feel like eating with the Gentiles on that occasion. He has a right not to eat with whomever he doesn't want to eat with. It was a big thing. And here is where I want Christians to understand that there must be a correlation between belief and behavior, between concepts and conduct, between doctrine and deed. There must be a correlation. 
There must be a continuity. There must be a continuum. By his behavior, Peter was belying what he believed. By his conduct, Peter was cutting against his concepts. By his deeds, he was putting the lie to his doctrines. Remember, both Peter and Paul believed and preached the same gospel that it is not now necessary for Gentiles to keep the Mosaic law to be saved. All they have to do is put saving faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary. If that is so, Peter, why then are you not eating with the Gentiles? Your behavior is saying something completely different from what you and I believe and preach. Can I challenge all of us here who are believers? That when we operate, as I was saying last night, in the marketplace, people must see the same behavior pattern as they would in the holy place. There must be continuity. By the way we operate, people must know who rules our lives. They must know who is Lord, who calls the shots. If there's a radical discontinuity, then they are going to wonder what's up, and then we confuse them. And look what happened when Peter behaved inconsistently and hypocritically. He led astray many of the Jews. Verse 13, in so much that even Barnabas, Paul's colleague, Paul's associate, was led astray by Peter's behavior. Who wouldn't be led astray? If as a preacher of the gospel, a pastor of the church, I visit the rum bar regularly and in Biblica and my members see me, will they not feel that they can do it too? If Peter would back off from eating with Gentiles, something must be wrong with eating with Gentiles. And he led astray a whole bunch of Jews, including even Barnabas. And remember, Barnabas is the man who goes between tensions all the while. He's a son of consolation. He's an ameliorator. He's a peacemaker. Even he was led astray. If as a Christian, known to be a Christian in the office, and people know that I profess Christ, I fool around with every girl in the office just like the other men, will I not lead people astray by my conduct? If as a Christian businessman, known in the community to be a deacon in a church, to be an officer in a church, to be a lay preacher in a church, and I am indulging in shady business tactics and shady business deals, will I not lead people astray? It was necessary then for Peter to be put straight in public because Paul didn't have time to go and sit down with every single Dege Dege Jew, as we say in Jamaica, and talk to them about Peter's error. Just simply in love, confront him that everybody might hear and that he might learn a lesson to cut straight, to come clean. Preach what you live and live what you preach, Peter. Back up. Let everybody know where you stand. Why do you, Peter, as a Jew, live like the Gentiles normally and correctly, and now you're asking Gentiles to live like Jews, to heed dietary laws, which you and I know, along with all of the Mosaic law, came to an end at Calvary. Why, Peter? Why are you confusing people who are watching you as a champion of Christianity? Why are you confusing them? Cut straight. Come clean. Live what you preach. And for God's sake, preach what you live. The truth of the gospel was at stake. And Paul was not going to allow anybody, not Peter even, to compromise that truth. 
So Paul chided him publicly. A little tangent, but maybe an important tangent. This is after Calvary. There are some modern Judaizers who tell us, look, you must still keep the Sabbath. Why? Paul kept it. Peter kept it. Jesus kept it. Even after Calvary, the Sabbath was kept. No big thing. Even after Calvary, Jewish dietary laws were being heeded. The continuance of a practice is not the same as the necessity or the validity of the practice. These were Jews. That's their upbringing. A man cannot deny his ethnicity, his traditions of his people. No. In the same way you couldn't get me to stop speaking Patwa. I only talk like I talk because I'm here with you. In my house, it's dialect. I remember once a brother, shortly after I got saved, knowing that I was a high school student, was indignant that this high school boy who has a good education is speaking dialect. Rubbish. Because I know the Queen's English, I can't speak that which is a part of my people. They kept the Sabbath because it was a part of their upbringing. No problem. But here is where the problem comes in. Don't tell anybody, Peter, that the dietary laws are necessary and have any more validity for being set right before God. There's no problem with the brethren who worship God on a Saturday. Neither is there any problem with the brethren who worship God on a Wednesday. But do not go beyond that to tell me I am wrong because I'm not worshiping on a Saturday. Or I am wrong because I eat pork. Or I am wrong because I not circumcised. The issue then is not simply continuance after Calvary. It is validity and necessity after Calvary. For many things continued from the Jewish traditions even after they came to an end in Cal at Calvary. There is something that the, the writers of Jewish history don't seem to highlight and someday God granting me the time and the resources, I will pick it up. The Jews took quite a long time to learn many things. And I believe that when God destroyed, and he did, when God destroyed the temple in AD 70, he was rebuking their stubbornness and their reluctance to learn that his time had said at the cross, the first covenant came to a head and came to its end. And because they were reluctant, that which was the center of what they were continuing with had to be crushed to the ground. And the destruction of the temple in AD 70 was a signal from God to their stubbornness, their reluctance, and their dim-wittedness. You remember Jonah? You think God chose the Jewish people because they were good? No. They, like us today, are chosen to be vessels to bring the good news to the world. But they didn't take it. Jonah, go to Nineveh and warn the people. The man is reluctant to go. Why? Pure Gentiles in Nineveh. There are no Jews there. You don't preach to Gentiles. You don't give them God's blessings. And the man is reluctant. He goes there. God having twisted his arm behind his back. And he's still not willing to preach. Because if I tell them to repent and they repent, I know you, God, you're going to forgive them. So what happens? He preaches and God forgives the people. And Jonah says, see there, same thing. And the man grumbles and sits under a little gourd. And God had to dry it up just to rebuke his foolishness. They didn't want to take it. And even up to the New Testament era, the disciples did not want to move in obedience to Acts 1 8. Ye shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, your home territory, in Judea, the wider metropolis, 
in Samaria, Gentile territory, and onto the uttermost parts of the earth. So what did God have to do? Push a little persecution beneath them, force them out. Every time, God had to move his messengers to give the gospel to other people by compulsion. He's still doing that in the 20th century in Barbados. Because many of us are sitting down on our seats in church, locking up the salt and the light in the church building, and the world is starved of the light and the salt. Is it any wonder our culture is going Rastafarian? Is it any wonder that the religious zeal of the Muslims has overtaken the zeal of the Christians? But I said that was a tangent. So we get back on track and we look in the last place at Paul's defense of the gospel. Paul's defense of the gospel. And I would beg you, underline verse 16 in your Bibles and try to memorize it. Having denounced Peter, he goes on in verse 15 to say, We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified, is not set right, is not given special and sufficient spiritual status, by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we Jews have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. This, brethren, is the key verse in the epistle to the Galatians. The heart of the theological matter that Paul is going to expand on in the epistle and God willing throughout this week. This is the core of the gospel. Faith in Jesus Christ minus anything else. Be it Sabbath keeping, be it avoidance of pork, be it circumcision, be it the keeping of the Jewish feasts. It is faith in Jesus Christ minus everything else. No problem if you do the other things, but don't tell anybody that those other things are a part of the gospel, even a peripheral part. They have nothing whatsoever to do with the gospel. Says Peter, you and I know that. We are Jews, we're not Gentiles. But you and I have come into the revelation that we cannot be set right, we cannot be saved, we cannot get the right status by keeping the works of the law. We have tried that for years. And what was it, Peter? You and I know, Acts chapter 15, frustration. Peter called it a yoke and a burden. You couldn't get any life out of that. When you see the laws in your country in Barbados that you mustn't do this and you mustn't do that, it doesn't give you any power to avoid the wrong and do the right. No, it simply states what you must do and what you mustn't do. That's law. Law is limited in that regard. As we are going to see, and I must jump myself here, what Paul is calling them to is life in the spirit. A new sphere, a new dimension where the spirit gives you not only a conscience alive to right and wrong, but he gives you the inner power to do the right and avoid the wrong. You can't want anything else. And this is why again jumping myself to tomorrow, he calls them foolish. Not that you don't have brains, but you're not using them. How could you allow anybody, Peter? to make you become so hypocritical when you and I know that we are set right by faith in Jesus. So then attaining and maintaining spiritual status before God comes not out of the works of the law, comes not by circumcision, not by heeding dietary restrictions, not by keeping special days, months, times, and years, all works of the law, but 
by and through the faith in Jesus Christ. Even we Jews believed in Jesus. And I say to that hallelujah, that we might attain status and prestige and salvation in and through Jesus Christ. E.P. Sanders, who is a very astute writer on things Jewish, coined a verb, to righteous. That's the active form of the verb that he coined. And the passive form is to be righteous. It's an awkward coinage, but I like it. And he translates verse 16 this way, and I like it. Knowing that a man is not righteous by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we believed in Jesus Christ so that we would be righteous by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because no flesh will be righteous by or out of the works of the law. Justification is legal acquittal, but it goes a step further, as Paul is going to explain in the epistle. Now verses 17 through 19 are not the easiest verses to tackle in the original. They are difficult verses, but there is one thing that we can pull out of them, despite the problems that we would find textually. Let's just look at the English quickly though. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Having seen the non-necessity of the law, Paul is suggesting here, if, like Peter was doing, you go back now to give validity to the things of the law, you are making yourself a transgressor. What was happening to you all the while when you're not living as the law says you should live? You must have been doing wrong. So he says you're now building a foundation that you have already destroyed by your insight concerning grace in Jesus Christ. But we might look at it another way. That for the Orthodox Jew, a gospel of salvation by grace through faith without law would not only remove incentive for moral effort, but would lead to lower moral standards than under the law of Moses. Thus Christ would be seen as aiding and abetting sin. But Paul says, perish the thought. If I have renounced the law in Christ, and sin is found in my life, the conclusion is not that Jesus Christ causes the sin, but that I have failed. I have ceased to live in consistent obedience to the new life that I have. So he says in verse 19, I died, past tense, to the law, that I might live to God. That is, live under the control of God, for the honor of God. And then he goes to the very popular verse 20. Correctly translated, not I am crucified with Christ, which is true, but in the Greek perfect, I have been crucified with Christ. And every time you see the Greek perfect, it is important. An act completed in the past, but having abiding significance in the present. When Jesus Christ died, I died with him because he died for me. And that death has significance right now. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, you know it quite well. Not I am crucified with Christ here. Not being justified by faith, but having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. At Calvary, I was set right. And that setting right, which was done in the past, has abiding significance. That's the force of the Greek perfect. And Paul says here, the life that I now live as a result of what happened then for me, in my behalf, I now live 
by the faith of the Son of God. Praise God for this who loved me and gave himself for me. If you are here and you are unsaved, understand this. Even when you are not thinking about Jesus Christ, he's thinking of you. He loved you and he went to the cross in your place that you might now have freely offered and given to you abundant life. Fullness of life in the here and now and a solid guarantee for the hereafter. What better can anybody want than that? The drugs won't give it to you. Temporary fling in the here and now with guilt in the here and now and death in the hereafter. Christ gives you fullness of life now and fullness of life for the hereafter. No sexual bout can give you that. No seeking after prosperity and pleasure can give you that. It is only in Christ that you find what you need and lack. I beg you, even as we go through, yes, this very doctrinal study, that you open your heart to Jesus Christ and find what Paul found, what Peter found, and what all of us in Jesus Christ have found. Fullness of life in Jesus Christ. I close with this word. Underline again verse 21 in your Bibles, please. Absolutely important for the modern Judaizers. Paul says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness came by the law, then Jesus Christ died in vain. If a man could get special and sufficient spiritual status through the law, then Jesus Christ's death was superfluous, gratuitous, unnecessary, a grand waste of divine time. But he had to die because the law could not give anybody special, sufficient, and spiritual status. Thank God that Jesus came for what the law could not do in that it was weak in the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. If righteousness comes through the law, Jesus Christ died in vain. Have you yet believed in that Jesus? Have you put your complete trust and confidence in what he did on Calvary's cross and thereafter for you? If not, I beg of you, don't linger, for time will not always be at our disposal. And I beg of you, amidst the things that clamor for your attention and your allegiance in this world, remember, salvation is not a spear time issue. It's a prime time issue. Salvation is not a next time issue. It is a now time issue. God is saying to you, in the days of ignorance, I will wink at. But now, I command all men everywhere to repent. All right. I think that was uh, quite clear there. Yeah, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, both cannot be, both cannot, I like how you put it, that the law and the gospel cannot be uh, married. It can be, une they are unequally yoked. That's right. One, not, not, not piece of this and piece of that, but it's one or the other. Sorry. Yeah. yeah well, either or. Either or. Good. There you go. I mean, I guess with the law, you, you you did everything right, then, you know, you're good to go. You know, regardless of what was in your heart, you, you sacrificed and you, you cut the throat the right way and you separated the meat and the fat and, you know, everything was good. But the gospel is, it's it's much deeper than that. It's faith in, faith in uh, Jesus Christ himself. Mm -hmm. it's quite clear to me. <laughs> yes. Quite, quite I clear. need to recognize that with the law, if you are not perfect, 
not 99.9, 100% perfect in terms of obedience to it. It falls you. Sorry, you made a blunder over here. I know it is in this zero point something category, but you failed. Sorry, you yeah. can't get any benefit. Yeah. That's uh, a dilemma of law. Yeah. Grace says, believe and you will be forgiven, cleansed, and seen as righteous before God. Yep. I, I, I prefer that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I prefer that. Yeah. I mean, those some of those people, I mean, even even so I heard um I think is in, in, in Israel now they're they're eating uh a pork now. Okay. But then on the menu they call it white steak. <laughs> You know, and and then you know they they raise the pigs on elevated platforms so they're not actually touching the ground nice. of Israel. Yeah. So you know, just I said that to say, you know, what happens to those people that you know they take a white steak and then they find out that it's pork later on. I guess well, their their salvation or their their trip to heaven has been canceled because they had a piece of pork. All right, all right, know? yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and unbeknownst to them, you know, because many doesn't say pork, it says white steak. Yeah, so you're deceiving people technically. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. Not white steak of meat, it's white steak. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I was like, wow, I mean, I guess they're going to that. I guess, you know, there are other, you, know, you have the you have Christians who live there that probably would eat, you know, pork or whatever, so. Mm -hmm. why, why not capitalize on it that's right yeah but yeah yeah like you said uh give me the 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 grace from the gospel mm -hmm. versus the you know the absolute absoluteness of the law yeah it really works yeah yeah so, yeah you're based on your feel every time every time every time all right rev Bless you, my brother. Thank we'll you. Just, to God willing next week. Yep. Yeah, uh, we move on to the the part two of the same uh, Galatians, and uh, yeah. we go from there. All right. I'll, I'll go ahead and pray. Pray us out. Cool. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord. We thank you for this word and this this study into uh, Galatians to get us to realize that you know it's not just the law. It's not the law that we need to be saved, but is it is uh, by faith in jesus christ lord and 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 living and knowing the gospel that will uh save us and get us through and we thank you lord for your grace we thank you for uh your forgiveness that comes through uh in the gospel and uh, let us take it lord so and learn it lord and, and have it in our hearts so that we can share with others so they too can know that uh you know even though they may stumble that there is that forgiveness uh, so that they they may continue. You don't have to worry about making uh, a mistake and then being forever cast out and never having a chance because of the perfect perfectness of the law. But that by by what we learn in your gospel, that your grace is sufficient for us all. We uh, I ask you as we separate from one another, Lord, that you uh, you continue to care for us and continue to guide for us, Lord. And I ask for a special a uh, touch of healing lord on reverend chisholm uh Thank you god. know what he is going through with uh, his eyes and his sight uh we know it's gotten to a point lord where well in anything we look at lord that only you can deal with it so we ask you lord in in your absolute perfect will and your absolute power that you touch him lord if it is uh in your <clears throat> in your will lord in jesus name to to give him peace in that in that place to if if nothing gets better lord but we will absolutely celebrate with him in victory lord if you uh bring him through on the other side we thank you for all those who will listen to this uh in the future that they will definitely take it to heart in jesus name i pray amen 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 all right Jeff. Amen. yes sir you have a good rest of the week Shame on you, my brother. and stay dry
right at the <laughs> Charlotte. <laughs> All, right. All right. Yes, sir. I'm Night. Please, someone one dog for me. Yes, I will definitely. Listen. Okay, you too, sir. Night, night. Night. Bye.